Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Hey, listen, real quick. I want to introduce my friend Mark Horn. Mark, pastors, uh, who gets called to Bondi Beach, Australia? You know what I mean? That's like getting called to Hawaii. I mean, it's like I get San Bernardino, he gets Bondi Beach. What's that all about, you know? Uh, and uh, so anyway, Mark is uh, uh, a great man of God. And the reason I think we've known each other for years, and we just love each other, respect each other a whole lot, honor each other, is that we both have um, pastored in a resort area. And I'm not talking about San Bernardino. It's not a resort area. No, but, you know, we, Debbie and I learned how to pastor in Lake Arrowhead. You know, and if you ever try to, it, I know you guys don't understand what that means, pastoring in a resort area. Let me tell you what it's like. Resort areas are where people go to play, a vacation, time of fun, getting away. There's no way they want to go to church on Sunday. And, they, and the people that live in those areas, they work to service the people that come into a resort area for the weekends. So you just like busting it, trying to get church to go on Sunday. And it is one of the toughest things. So when we pastored in Lake Arrowhead, we understood that for years and years and years, how difficult it was. And we met Mark and Joy, and they pastored in a resort area called Bondi Beach, which is Australia, which is the one of the five nicest beaches on the planet, voted, I think, the fourth or fifth nicest beach on the planet. He has a church there. He's preaching the gospel, getting people saved. He is a really good guy, and you're going to love his accent. Would you stand to your feet and give the Lord a great big hand for God calling Mark Horan. Mark, get up here and tell us about Jesus. You want to make sure you're on? Am I on? Hello? Good evening. Good evening. How you doing? Good. You may be seated. Great to see you. And uh, count it an honor to be here. I hope you can understand my accent. If you don't understand what I say tonight, turn to the person next to you and say, what did he say? Why don't we pray, eh? Let's bow our heads. Lord, we do thank you for your goodness. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior who died for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who is with us and who wants to help us because you are the helper. We pray you're a great encouragement, your conviction and your blessing and your love and your power and your releasing spirit be here tonight in every way. We thank you. We know that this church is incredibly blessed because it's full of people who love Jesus. And so help me tonight, Lord, to just speak your heart to the people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to be here. I, uh, I thank God. Joy and I actually thank God for uh, Jim and Deb. Met them many years ago. And uh, gosh, he's encouraged me as a pastor. Just firstly, I think just to be myself. Secondly, to just go for all that God has for us. And uh, do you know in Australia, the rock church is now famous? Do you want me to say that again? <laughs> the rock church is actually now famous. Ever since Jim came down there and Deb and preached, you know, pastors click on and, you know, then you had a gathering last year and, and guys came again from different places. And uh, people just, you know, they... they, they Log on to the podcast, and uh, they think it's awesome. So you're having an impact all over the world. Isn't that good, eh? Yeah. You know, you should never doubt the greatness that God can release out of your life if you trust him. The Bible says their sound went out to all the earth. So uh, I just thank God for Jim and Deb and the team here. And uh, we believe the best is yet to come. Do you believe that? I believe your best days, your greatest moments, the greatest miracles, the greatest days of health, the greatest moments in church, the greatest favor is yet to come. Whatever you've had to this, there's more. 
But you know, I got this thought when I stand on the front road tonight, you never get disappointed when you come to the house of God. It doesn't matter who's preaching. You never get, you never get, because you come with an expectation God will meet you. Isn't that good? So, um, just before I bring in the word tonight, a pastor stood up in the, down south of, uh, I think down Louisiana way, is that how you pronounce it? Louisiana. And uh, he said, uh, uh, does anyone have any sort of needs? I'd like to pray for you this morning. You have any sort of need, financial, emotional needs, spiritual needs? So Brother Leroy put his hand up and said, yes, I'd like you to pray for my hearing pastor. So he comes up the front and they gather around the elders. And the pastor said, I'll do what Jesus did. I'll stick my fingers in his ear. You know what Jesus stacked his fingers? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd release his hearing and his ears would be clear and he'd hear. Pulls the fingers out and says, how do you feel? How's your hearing, Leroy? He looks up at the pastor and says, I won't know, pastor, till Thursday because my hearing's not till Thursday. Did you get that? Good. Now listen, I'm not a showy guy. I'm just, I was born in the outback. So I just want you to relax. Um, I'm a normal person. And I want to speak to you tonight about this thought, there is forgiveness in, in your future. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and 20 tonight. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and 20 says this. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached to you beforehand. What a beautiful scripture. You know, I was just thinking recently about, as we're coming to the end of the year, you know, it's been a long, it's been a great year, it's been a tough year for us, it's been a great year, that it's actually good to wipe the slate clean, start afresh with God and with people. You know, sometimes we have tough years where we have conflict and difficulty. We have hurts. We have things happen that we don't even understand with people, you know, they offenses and, and, and all sorts of things. And uh, I was thinking about the power of forgiveness. And this scripture came to me about how God blots out our sins. And when we do that, we walk in Christ. There are times of refreshing come upon our lives. I began to think about the thought of forgiveness. And it says this, the act of forgiving or the state of being forgiven. Powerful thought. You know, when you think about what the Bible says, that when we come to Jesus Christ, our sins are totally forgiven. Isn't that beautiful? Come on, give the Lord a clap for that. In fact, when we come to Christ and accept Christ as our Savior, our sins are completely forgiven. Say that, completely. completely. They're put in the sea of forgetfulness, and then God puts up a sign, no fishing. And, uh, you know, I began to think about this word blotted out. It's an interesting word. It comes from the same word to obliterate. It means to erase, to cancel, to remove. Um, it has this definition, to destroy completely, to abolish, to eradicate, to erase, to exterminate, to finish off. You know, you know, at the end of each meeting, I love your pastor because he does an altar call so people can come to Christ and be born again. That's an interesting word. The Bible says unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is that? Well, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to actually go back into your mother's womb. What it means, you think about a birth, it's a new beginning. When a child's born, it's a new beginning, isn't it? Come on. It's the beginning of a new life and a new day. And that's the term the Bible uses when we come to Christ, we're born again, we get a fresh start in life. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. 
God is so wonderful, isn't he? He gives us a fresh start. Like, he doesn't give us a, like a 50% start. He gives us a whole new life and a whole new start. Isn't that wonderful? Beautiful. That's going to save you some money at some psychiatrist. You got a whole new start. Everything is totally forgotten and forgiven. Beautiful, isn't it? It's called, We're Now Reconciled to God. I love this scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I want you to think about that. That's the power of Jesus Christ. At the end of this meeting, we, we will do an altar call. And if you're in this meeting for the first time, we invite you to receive Jesus into your life, the living Jesus, the risen Jesus, so he can come into your heart and forgive you of all your sins and begin a new life. Isn't that? All things pass away and all things become new. And I want you to think about that thing. All things, everything. Not You know, there's some good things in our life. God won't eradicate, you know, the good memories of life. And talking about the sin in our life. And that all passes away and he gives us a whole new life. Isn't that awesome? Come on, that's awesome, isn't it? You don't get that at going down to the local club. That's the greatness of God, the goodness of God. And, and this scripture says that God was in Christ, verse 19, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting their trespasses against them. I love that. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. That's the power of coming to Jesus. All your sins are forgiven. Now you're reconciled to God. You've got... You haven't got religion. You've got a relationship with God where he gives you a new start and a new life, wipes the slate clean, and then you have an access to God. Isn't that awesome? Come on. You've got an access to God Almighty to go to him with all your needs, everything you go through, he's going to be there, and at the end of it all, you're going to go to heaven. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? That's Give Jesus a clap. Come on. And you know, in, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, I love this phrase. At the end of the scripture, it says, be ye reconciled to God. You know, when I was studying, you know, to be a pastor, a lot of my study was in the, the knocks of life, the school of life. <laughs> you know, God called me in. But, you know, I did, did a, a year of theology. And, you know, the chief end of man, the chief end of man is to be reconciled to his God. Come back to God, to know God, to ask forgiveness and start again, and then to live for him. This is an awesome, awesome thought. Be ye reconciled to God. That's something you can go out into the community and share. Be reconciled to God. Be made right. So now you become a Christian and you're following Christ. And you begin to live by faith and you're trusting God. Now, let me just ask you this. Does that mean you're never going to sin again? Come on. Does that mean you're never going to sin again? No, of course it doesn't. <laughs> Some people think, you know, when you become a Christian, you've got to be perfect. No, it just means your sin is now covered by the grace of God. Isn't that awesome? But the thought tonight I want to share with you is this. You need to keep short accounts. Let me say that again. I found this, my, I'm preaching myself. You've got to keep short accounts with your life. Not in a way. Now, let me just share my, my life. It's very important you don't beat yourself up, but you build yourself up. You ever seen people beating themselves up? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm you know, blowing it with God. You know, you actually, it's called growing up is actually learning to actually, I think, Point out the wrong in your life and deal with it and keep short accounts and actually see the good in your life. Come on. So here's this thought that I, I, I use for me. Don't beat yourself up, build yourself up. Say that. Turn to the person and say that next to you. Don't beat yourself up. Actually, there's three thoughts in, in Scripture when you're talking about helping people there. Uh, this, you know, it talks about exhorting people. 
to exhort them to go fully for God. That's number one. Because if you don't exhort them, they won't go up. Okay? And the second thought is that you need to encourage them. <laughs> because if you don't encourage them, they'll give up. And the third one is comfort. The three thoughts in pastoring people I've learned. Because if you don't comfort, they'll beat themselves up. And as you're dealing with people in life, if you exhort them to go for all that God has, go higher with God, go all the way with God. Come on, come on. Come on, you can go higher. Get your Bible out this week, go higher. Don't stop climbing the mountain. Come on. Because if you don't exhort someone, they won't go up any further. Come on, come up the mountain. Secondly, if you don't encourage them, your pastors are great, they'll want to give up. Come on, you can do it. Keep going. And then the third one is comfort. Because if you don't comfort people, they tend to beat themselves up. Great thought, isn't it? You've got to keep short accounts with God, though, I've learned. Now, can I just uh, give you a few thoughts on, on behavior that I learned when I was younger? Everyone say behavior. behavior. You know, as a pastor, I don't put a camera in the houses of my people and check on them. I don't have cameras on their, in their living rooms. <laughs> I spy with my little eye. <laughs> and most pastors don't. Your, past, your pastor doesn't. No pastors that, that really love God love people too. But you know what I learned? You know what? We want the best for you, but you've actually got to monitor your own behavior. You've got to be called, uh, what's, uh, oh, maybe I get it wrong because of my terminology. You've got to be self-policing. Everyone say self-policing. Self You've got to actually police yourself on stuff, not in a bad way, but in a positive way. You know, um, one of the secrets about being a Christian is what you do in secret. Even if you heard that thought tonight, one of the secrets about being a Christian, I mean, the, the secret of the gospel is Jesus. I mean, it's not a secret, but it's, it's he's, he's the power. But, you know, beyond that, it's actually what you do in secret. There's the real power in your life, how you live when you're on your own. <laughs> Say that, what I do in secret. That's a great thought, isn't it? I, I love this. Uh, I love this thought in the book of Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. Uh, Why well, am I saying this? Because, you know, as, you, as you, you're walking forgiveness, you've got to also walk in wisdom about your life. It says here, 1 Timothy 1, verse 19, it says, holding faith and a good conscience which some have put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck or, or have shipwrecked themselves. Now, when I was younger and God touched my life, I had a deep conviction about changing my life. But I had to do it in my own secret life, and not as, you know, when I was on my own. I had to work on myself. I had to police myself, okay? The Bible says something interesting here. It says, having faith and a good conscience. So you got faith. We live by faith in Jesus Christ. We live by faith and trust in God. And the other is a good conscience. Isn't that it? You've got two very important things here. Who's ever rowed a boat? Any sailors here? Anyone been out in a little rowboat? You ever, you ever gone out in a rowboat and rowed one oar? You ever notice that when you row one oar? So, if you row one oar, what happens when you row one oar? So we give that oar a rest and we decide, okay, let's throw the other oar. What happened? Here's the thought God gave me when I was much younger. I'm still young. <laughs> 
If faith is one or, which is very important, and a good conscience or your character or your behavior, or what you do in secret, unless you... Now, here's the thing. The Bible says if some, this is really interesting in this scripture, because, and you, you'll, see, you'll see this in people, not uh, which some, listen, which some have put away concerning the faith have, have become shipwrecked. You know what I've discovered? If you, you're rowing faith and, and a good conscience in your life, you can get through any storm. You don't mean if the wind's blowing, it doesn't, you, you'll get through it. Come on. Okay? Now, I mention that your behavior, not in a way. You, you ask my wife, I, I don't do this, I, I, build, I build people up. But you know what? You know, when you have to check yourself, you have to work on yourself so you can actually become more like Christ. Okay? All right? So, uh, and can I just throw this in? When you're going through a storm in life, please don't equate a storm with failure. Because some days you just wake up and you're in a storm. Some days you get out of bed and you're in a storm for no reason. Sometimes you're in a storm because you're in the will of God. Okay, don't equate a storm with failure. I'm perishing. No, you're not. You're just, you're probably going the right way. Keep rowing. Okay. Is this good? Still like me? Great. Okay. Can you understand me? So you have, to, you, have to, you have to deal with your own behavior. Behavior is the mirror in which everyone shows their image. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? It's the unseen and the spiritual in people that determines the outward and the actual. They're scriptural thoughts. You have to deal with your behavior. Um, so I'm going to leave that there now. Now, can I just talk to you about forgiveness? Because if you deal with your own behavior, then we can get on to this, all right? Uh, forgiveness, there's not a person who doesn't sin against God and sin against other people, even as a believer. Um, but if you live in unforgiveness, you actually get into a place of judgment and hurt and torment and you lose your freedom. I love this Ecclesiastes 7, 19 to 22. It says this, Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. For there's not a just man on earth who does good and doesn't sin not, or doesn't sin. Also, do not take heed to every word spoken against you, lest you hear your servant cursely. For oftentimes and you, you know in your own heart that you've cursed others. Now, do you want me to put that in Australian translation? Do you want me to put that in Australian? Is this all right? Listen, don't let everything get to you that other people say about you. Because you've actually think, thought those things about other people. That's what that scripture is saying. I don't like you. Well, you probably thought that about, I don't like you either. You know? <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? So the scripture said, don't take, you know, one of the things that, that offense and hurt does, it actually... You, you get a wall up against it. Don't, just don't let it get into your heart. You know, sticks and stones. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I, I love you, pastors. They, they got such a great attitude. Such a great attitude, you know, about our life and people. And I, I, I think we, we have to get a little bit wiser about stuff because we, don't, we live in a fallen world. Isn't that true? Very interesting. But you know that when stuff does happen, the answer is forgiven. Being forgiven or forgiveness. Forgiving people and forgiveness. You know, in Mark chapter 11, 22 to 26, Jesus said to them, have faith in God. For I say unto you, whoever says to this mountain, this is a very famous scripture, very powerful scripture, be removed and cast in the sea, it doesn't doubt in his heart shall believe those things which he says will come to pass and he'll have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, whatever you desire when you pray, 
believe you'll receive them and they shall be yours. Powerful faith scriptures. Listen to the next verse. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have any against another, that your Father in heaven may forgive your sin or trespass. If you be not forgiven, neither will your Father forgive you. Um, you know what? I, I reckon there's a real just, uh, you know, just every so often you just need to just, just uh, in a way, we're not beating yourself up, just saying, Lord, well, I just, I want to clean the slate. I just, I, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to ask forgiveness if I've done something to you or I've, someone's hurt me or I've hurt someone else. And you actually just forgive and let it go. And you know when you do that, an incredible freedom will come into your heart. Because, you know, like for me, I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a faith preacher, but, you, you know, I'm just like, I'm this sort of, I just try and have faith and believe God. But every so often I just need to make sure that I'm keeping short accounts with things, that I'm clearing the slate. Is that cool tonight? And maybe, you know, you, this year you've had some hurts and some difficulties and God actually wants to give you a fresh start and he needs you to forgive that person and that conflict. Change something. You know, uh, think about this, that um, you might say to me, well, I'm hurt. Well, we all get hurt. But did God forgive you? Come on, did God forgive you? Yes. Did he wipe the slate clean? Yes. Did he give you a fresh start? Yes. When you came to Christ, did you, you know, I love that t when times of refreshing, time, you know, I don't know about you, but I felt incredibly loved and blessed when I first came to Christ. Like, like a fresh start, like getting under a shower. Refresh. Come on. And you know what? I, I think that scripture's ongoing. Like you don't have to keep... Go and receive Christ every five minutes. But I think when you, when you keep short accounts, there's refreshing comes into your life. Come on. You're refreshed and rejuvenated and refilled and touched and refired. Come on. Come on. Powerful, isn't it? And I was just sharing this thought the other day as we were coming to a close, uh, you know, and coming to close the year in our own church. Think about this, God forgave you. In Romans chapter 5, 6 to 8, when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. When you had no strength, you had no hope, Jesus Christ came into the world and died for you. God, verse 8, God commended his love towards us, and yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's beautiful, isn't it? Ephesians says this, God is rich in mercy and great in love, which he loves us. When we were dead in our sins, has quickened us together with Christ by grace you're saved, raised us up together and made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places. You know, what does that mean, you know, raised us? Does that mean I'm sort of floating around? No, I, actually, you live in a place of freedom. You live in a place of freedom because you're forgiven. People, people sometimes travel geographically to get away from something, but they don't get away from it. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? But when you come to Christ, you actually get free in your spirit no matter where you are. It's awesome, isn't it? Powerful. By grace you're saved. Can I just encourage you to draw near to God this coming year? Get a fresh vision. Just look to the Lord, open your Bible. You've got to be doing all this stuff, but just, just draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God is incredibly merciful, isn't he? So what happens, you know, when you don't forgive, you actually are holding people in judgment. You know, here's a thought that God gave me. And uh, we went through something a number of years ago. And uh, I got this thought, when I hold people in judgment, I'm trying to fix it. I'll fix you. But I got news for you. You can't fix it. You can't fix it. You got to let go and let God. If you let go, 
God will fix it in a moment. Isn't that awesome? You can't fix it. You're trying to fix it, but if you let it go, God will fix it. He can fix it in a moment. Years ago, Joe and I were up working in a situation and there was a person who just got a bee in their bonnet about us. And I actually think we didn't do anything wrong. She just got an attitude towards it. And it was awkward, I tell you, man. It wasn't it, honey? Like, gosh, you walk into the room and ooh, it was awkward. I didn't want to go into that room and that person was in there. I'd, I'd stand up the back. And we all had that sort of thing. And you know what? It went on for a year and it went on. And I didn't even know what we did or who did what or why. And I, at the start of it, I thought, well, you know, well, I didn't do anything wrong. I got nothing to forgive. And then, you know, the Lord spoke to me and he said, go and ask her forgiveness. I thought, that's got to be the Holy Spirit. So I walked into the room and I said, whatever I've done to you, I want you, I want to ask your forgiveness. And she broke down and cried and cried and cried and cried and the shutters went down the bars disappeared she said will you forgive me I'm sorry about all this stuff I don't even know how it happened and you know what I felt incredibly free up like showers of freedom came on me time I got refreshed and rejuvenated Is this good tonight I got totally refreshed and rejuvenated. I think when we don't forgive, we hold people in torment or we torment ourselves. Stop trying to fix it. Just forgive and God will fix it. How's that, eh? Yeah. It's going to save you a lot of worry. You'll start sleeping at night. You'll feel better. The burden will break off you. <laughs> You know, uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a thought that comes out of the scriptures. Forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them more. <laughs> Forgiveness is a funny thing. It warms the heart and cools the sting. Forgiveness is a gift to yourself. Forgiveness is the virtue of the brave. Forgiveness is the economy of the heart. Forgiveness saves the expense of anger, the cost of hatred, and the waste of spirits. Forgiveness is the final form or act of love. Mark Twain said this. I'm not a great quote person. I like to quote off the scripture. Forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heels that have crushed it. Crushed it. Forgiveness is the giving and the so receiving of life. Forgiveness is the key to action and freedom. Forgiveness means letting the past go. Genuine forgiveness does not deny anger, but faces it head on. And I pray tonight as I come to a close that uh, maybe you're frustrated with God. I don't know. You know, you know what I've discovered? You've got to let God be God. He doesn't do things your way, your time. That's why he's leading you. You're not leading him. The Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth me. Who's leading who here? Let God be God. He'll do things a different way and he'll do them a different time. But you've got to let God be God. Let go and let God, okay? Maybe you're frustrated with God. You've got to let go. Secondly, maybe there's some people you just need to go in this week and say, well, I just want to ask your forgiveness. I want to release you. And obviously there's some things, you know, if, if someone has done something, we've lost a loved one, that's really, that's harder. But it's still the final act of freedom to let go and let it, give it to God. Do you love me? Is this all right? You getting blessed? Times in refreshing will come from the Lord.
You know, there's a beautiful scripture to end tonight, and it's this in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Powerful scripture. I pray tonight God speaks to your heart and maybe go release someone this week or whatever you need to do. Maybe God himself opens some stuff. But you'll feel incredible freedom. You'll feel times of refreshing. You'll move forward in God. Amen? God bless you, Pastor. Thanks, Mark. Love you, bud. Somebody give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, just want to give you an opportunity tonight. Here you are in this safe and friendly place. And, you know, I think one of the greatest tragedies in the world is you come in, you hear a message, and, and, and it's just a little bit. You get a little bit out of that, and you take it home with you, and you start living that, and that's great. But until you're right with God, nothing seems to be right with you. And I mean right with God that, for an example, if you walked out of this place and your heart stopped and you died, being right with God means you would open your eyes in heaven. Being wrong with God would be you open your eyes in hell. I don't think anybody in this room wants to open their eyes if they should die in the next few minutes in hell. And I want to give you an opportunity to get right with God. And I want to say this, I want you to hear me. The right way. Did you know there's a right way of getting right with God and a wrong way? The wrong way, you won't get to heaven. The right way is God's way. The wrong way is what you and I think is going to get us to heaven. What society or social systems tell us how we're going to get to heaven. What Hollywood says about how to get to heaven. It won't get you to heaven. The right way is what Jesus said. Stop and think about it for a moment. The one who's a beaten, bloody mess, nailed to the cross, pays the price for you and I, by his shed blood forgives, of, uh, forgives us of our sins so that we can go to heaven. And then he comes along and he says, well, whatever you think will get you in heaven, that's okay. Whatever you think, you know, if that group says it, it's, that's okay too, you know. It's not true. Jesus makes it very clear that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now listen to these words of Jesus. And no man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. You can't get to heaven any other way but his way. Can't get to heaven your way. Can't get to heaven my way. Can't get to heaven Mark's way. You can only get to heaven God's way. And a lot of times we don't know what that way is. We think being good is going to get us there. We think maybe even going to church or joining the church is going to get us there. You know, if we fit into society or the social system, that's good enough. You know, nobody's looking for us. The police aren't chasing us. I guess I'm nice enough to make it to heaven. That's not what God's looking for. That's not what will get you to heaven. If you're going to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven Jesus' way. And Jesus tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture. Exactly. In John 3rd chapter, he says these words to a man by the name of Nicodemus. He says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. A lot of people that attend American churches don't know what that means, but let me tell you what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, here's what born again means. That you have given God all of your heart. You have given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been, it always will be. All or nothing. God forgive us in American churches for the last 250 years. We've watered that down, and it's so sad, but it's all or nothing. And I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is himself speaking. He says these words in the word of God in the book of Revelation. I'm coming again, and you know he is. 
just don't know when, but you know he is. He says, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. I mean, that's a harsh, hard thing to say. You know, a lot of times we have this picture of Jesus being so sweet and kind and gentle. That's almost a rude statement. I'll vomit you from my mouth if I come back and find you lukewarm. What he really just said is people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not going to make it at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus when he comes back. Let me define for you what lukewarm is. Lukewarm, little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, Jesus is something in your life, but he's not everything. You know, that's what it is. He is, uh, you know, you, 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 he's there, but he's not your everything. He's just something. You're not against him. Here's lukewarm, but you're not wholehearted for him. And you're classified in the, by the scriptures, lukewarm. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to vomit you from his mouth. Now look, that's a hard thing for me to say. But somebody, isn't it true that somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth? I love and respect and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it unless you give God all of your heart, you give God all of your life. You notice how I emphasize the word give because you got to give it to him. He's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to manipulate you out of this, talk you out of it, hit you in the head with a two by four. I mean, stop thinking about it. God could have made a billion trillion robots all to serve him, yell for him, sing to him, salute him, call him wonderful, but he doesn't. He gives you and I a free will choice. It's in that choice that you give God all of your heart. You give God all of your life. It's your choice. Remember how I used the name Nicodemus? I said he came to Nicodemus. Why Nicodemus? Why is it in the scripture? So that you and I can see a very valuable lesson. Nicodemus was probably better in his lifestyle than all of us. He was a keeper of the law, memorized the scripture, quoted the scripture, listen to this, debated the scripture, sang the scripture. How many of you have sung the scripture? Fed the poor in his community. This guy was a great guy. Wouldn't you think that Jesus would have come to Nicodemus, patted him on the back and said, wow, good job, Nicodemus. You're going to love heaven. Heaven's waiting for you, but he doesn't. He comes to this guy that does far beyond what most of us have ever done. And he says these words to him, you must be born again. It's the same thing with you and I tonight. We must be born again to get into heaven and be right with God. And you're going to have to get born again by doing something that you need to do. I can't do it for you. You've got to give him all of your heart. You've got to give him all of your life. So tonight, here in this safe and friendly place where it's a time of a divine appointment you have with God. You know what I mean by divine appointment? You've had a lot of appointments in your life with attorneys and doctors, and you've had a lot of appointments with dentists and painters and plumbers, but here's an appointment you have with God. Tonight is your night of salvation. What for? To give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Why? Because you want to go to heaven and you don't want to go to hell. And that's the only way you must be born again and tonight here we are and his blood will wash away the sins you'll be forgiven and all of your sins will be forgotten and you can move on in the victory of Jesus for the rest of your life tonight's your night you say well Pastor Jim how do I do it well let's do it Jesus's way Jesus said if you confess me before men I'll confess you before my father but if you deny me I'll deny you that's what Jesus said in a moment, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one, two, three, and then I'll hit this pulpit. It'll sound like this. One, two, three. I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, your hand goes up. When you hear this sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand. 
What you're saying by the raising of your hand is, I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart and give him all of my life. Be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. I want to be born again. And I'll see it. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man. I'll see you do it. Who should raise their hand in a moment when I count to three and bang that pulpit area? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. You know who you are, whether you've really given him all of your heart. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Don't just leave this place. Come in and just walk out and say, well, I hope I make it. Because nobody can hope their way to heaven. You've got to make sure. Maybe you've never given him all of your life. You know who you are. Tonight is your night of salvation. You've never given him all of your heart. You've never given him all of your life. Get ready to pop your hand up. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. If I put my hand up, I'll be embarrassed. Uh, 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 people behind me or people that I came with, they'll see me. Uh-huh, they might. But it's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever, ever and ever, ever and ever. Tonight is your night of salvation. Tonight, God brought you here. This is your time with God. I'm going to count to three now. Pop my hands on this pulpit area. You get your hand up. Let me see it. And then put it right back down. How simple, simple, simple can that possibly be? Tonight is your night all across this auditorium. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. Thank you. There's two. God bless you. Anybody else? There's three. Thank you. There's four. Thank you. There's five, six. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's seven. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's another one. They're pointing here. Eight. God bless you. Anybody else? Eight wise people. Anybody else? Where are you? Nine and ten. I just feel like there's at least a couple more of you in here. There's, there's at least a couple more of you. Where are you? There's nine and ten. If you're saying to yourself, I, I, I wonder if I've really given God all my heart. I wonder if I've really done that. I know who he is in my head. I celebrate Christmas every year. I know who Jesus is, and of course you do. The question is not whether you know him in your head. The question is whether you've given him all of your heart. Thank you, nine. Where are you? Thank you, ten. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Have you given him all of your heart? I already know you know him in your head. There's 10 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 10 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All 10 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Friend, if you're in the family room, you raised your hands. You can bring your children. That's okay. If your children raise their hand, you, you know, your children will remember this. I remember Debbie always tells me the story when she was six or seven, eight years old, when she went forward in a little Baptist church, when she gave her heart, she's never forgot it. So get ready, parents, to bring your children. But the rest of you that are adults that are in here, that you raised your hands, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. You come here right now. We're going to pray together. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, and I live for come you. Come on, that's it, they're coming, give them a hand as they come, you come every too. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Come on, you can come too, just get your stuff in a hurry, come on. Lord, have your Oh, they're still Lord, coming. Give them a hand as they come. My heart. You can come too. Come on. They're still I coming. Come on. Give them a hand as they come. Alone, every breath that I take. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Come on. You can do better than that. Give them a better warm welcome than that. God is so good. Well, there's more than 10 of you up here in front. 
Thank God you have come real quick. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look to your left. Do you see this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. He's a really good guy. No weird or strange stuff goes on, I promise you, okay? He, let me tell you what he's going to do. He's going to do three things. I want you to know what they are. Here's the three things. One, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to do that. Two, he's going to give you some free information to take home. Absolutely free. It'll tell you what to do next now that you're a Christian. Just read it and follow the instructions. So simple. Three, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. They're friends that will help you get strong in Jesus. Meet you before church service. You know, go over some scripture for you, with you. Pray for you during the week. You need to have a friend to go on with Jesus so you don't go back, fall through the cracks. We don't want you to do that. Only takes a few moments. If you came with a wait for you, make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't God good?